Returning to the subject of hospitality tonight, you can turn to Romans chapter 12. This must be a subject that is of interest on a broader scale of the messages downloaded from Sermon Audio. This is one of the top ones that has been downloaded recently, so I take that to mean there are people who have an interest in the subject uh, and I assume Christians have an interest in uh, the subject. It is a subject that is important. We tried to show that last week as we surveyed the emphasis that God brings to hospitality in His Word. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies and love one another. Really establish the heart behind the spirit of hospitality. Self-denial consideration of others above ourselves, and a desire to manifest the Spirit of Christ in and to this world will produce a spirit of hospitality. In Romans 12 and verse 13, the Scriptures say, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality, given to hospitality. We noted last week there are several, five times the word uh, that is translated hospitality or entertain, entertain strangers is translated in Hebrews 13 too. That word is used five times in Romans 12, 13, Hebrews 13 2, 1 Timothy 3 2, Titus 1 8, quali qualities that are to be found in an elder, a bishop, and then the exhortation, 1 Peter 4 9, which we'll Look at briefly this evening as well. Webster 1828 Dictionary defines hospitality this way. The act or practice of receiving and entertaining strangers or guests without reward or with kind and generous liberality. As we noted last week, this may be done with or without a home of your own. Who is the, who is the model? Who is the perfect model for hospitality? It is the Lord Jesus Christ, and He had no place to lay His head. But He was hospitable. And so we took from that, with other thoughts that we put forth, that this is, it is, it is, it is possible to be hospitable without having a home of your own. And this is especially important for those perhaps in a marriage relationship where if you're a, a believing woman and your wife and your husband is not or he's not he's not open to using your home for hospitality, you as a believing woman can still be hospitable. You can manifest that spirit. There are ways to work out the spirit of hospitality as we indicated last week. As where the spirit of hospitality exists like Christ, we're going to find ways to work it out. And that's the bottom line. We will not use excuses, and we're, we love to use excuses, but we will not use excuses, but rather that spirit will find a way to express itself. And so Paul says, given to hospitality. Paul is describing a characteristic of saints as he writes here, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality is not, is not, um, is an, it's, it's describing the characteristic, the nature of a believer, one who is filled with the love of Christ. We are to be ones who are characterized as given to hospitality. And this is not primarily speaking of planned fellowships or socialization among those that we know. As we saw last week, the very word that is translated, hospitality, has in it the idea of stranger and to be fond of, or to be to like, or to love, phileo, and the word for stranger. And so it is to be fond of, of strangers. So the very word itself has the idea of reaching out beyond that circle of individuals that you know best or with whom you are most comfortable. Now, as we indicated last week, that's important. Scripture is not saying don't fellowship with those that you're comfortable. Don't socialize with those with whom you're comfortable. 
but rather we are to be we are to go beyond that circle. We're to open ourselves up beyond that circle of our familiarity and we say our comfort zone in, a, in order to engage with those that are not as well known. Hospitality then involves selfless giving motivated by compassion for our neighbor. And at this point, you may ask, who is my neighbor? And that question leads us to Luke chapter 10. And Scripture helps us here in this interaction that Jesus had with this particular lawyer who had asked him a question and Jesus engages him. And I want to read verses 25 through 37. I think this is pertinent to the discussion of hospitality and who it is that we are to be demonstrating this compassion, this mercy, this love toward. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up, Luke 10, 25, and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, he, an, he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. I think the lawyer was probably pretty proud of himself. He, he knew the answer and he gave the answer. I don't know that he knew what he was really saying. But he gave the answer, and he was right. Jesus says in verse 28, he said to him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. And isn't that what the law says? Do and live. The only problem is we fail. The problem is we come short. The problem is if that's what life depends on, we're doomed. We're condemned. But the Pharisee doesn't think that way. The self-righteous person doesn't think that way. This man didn't think that way. So in verse 29, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now there are other things, other reasons why he may have asked this question, but it did strike me that oftentimes this is the way people respond. When an answer is given, uh, someone is facing a problem, someone is facing a difficulty, and an answer is given, oftentimes a person answers with a question in order to divert the subject, in order to get themselves off the hook, in order, to, in order to justify themselves, maybe to try to muddy the waters, to bring confusion to the answer that has that is the correct answer. And it seems like maybe that's what's going on here. But perhaps more to the point, he was answering in light of the understanding of that day, Jews understood their neighbors to be fellow Jews. He understood their neighbor to be those who were of the re same religious brand, the same ethnicity as themselves. Interesting. That's their neighbor. Not necessarily the one that lives next door, but the one who is like me. The one that I relate to. Jesus answered him, verse 30, and said, answering said, a certain man went down. Who was my neighbor? A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, a dangerous route, fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, so this would be a Jew, saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, obviously a Jew, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. So it wasn't a case of ignorance, a case of not knowing the need. Something else was going on. And a certain, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, a Samaritan is one that the Jews would have nothing to do with. Uh, there were racial tensions between the Samaritans and the Jews. There were religious tensions between the Samaritans and the Jews. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion 
on him. Actually, you notice on him is italicized, which tells you the translators inserted that. He had compassion. That This is getting to the heart of the subject, isn't it? He had compassion. And that's what motivated him. He went to him. He bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Do you think that this certain Samaritan had a destination? Do you think he had a schedule? Do you think he was going somewhere? Do you think this interrupted the flow of his day? Do you think that this messed with his agenda? Do you think that he was kept from perhaps getting to the place that he had in mind at the time that he had in mind to get there? Do you think that he possibly could have been opening himself up for danger? After all, that man lay there because he was robbed and beaten. Wouldn't it have been wiser for this man to have said, I'm not going to risk it. I'm moseying on. I'm getting on down the road. But he had compassion. It's interesting how compassion overrides a lot of the excuses that we could otherwise come up with. He went to him. Verse 34, bound up his wounds. I already read that. Verse 35, and on the morrow when he departed... He took out two pence, which as I understand it was probably two days wages, which would have supplied more than two days in the end, but probably two days wages. When's the last time you pulled out two days wages and gave to somebody that you saw was in need? And gave them to the host. He gave it to the host, didn't give it to the the man there. That might be instructive there. And said to him, take care of him. Whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. You know, here's the way we read scripture like this. We're reading this and rather than take it at face value and understand what Christ is driving at, we come back with all kinds of questions, don't we? All kinds of exceptions and all kinds of reasons why that wouldn't work today. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy. That word mercy there is the root is found in the word compassion. He that showed mercy. He that showed compassion on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. It's not convenient to be a lover of strangers, is it? Hospitable. A lover of strangers. It's not convenient. You can't schedule it. Let's see, next Thursday. There, we have an opening on the calendar. Next Thursday, we're going to be hospitable. That's not really the way hospitality generally... Not this kind of hospitality. Now, fellowship does... Socialization does. We can schedule those things. But hospitality is something beyond that. It's a spirit and an attitude that is willing to make sacrifices, willing to give of ourselves, willing to have our schedule interrupted, willing to actually cost us something, even put ourselves perhaps in danger. Preacher, how far are you telling us to go with this? I'm just... I'm just reading the Scriptures to you. You need to make the application. Every situation is different. But hospitality is not optional for an obedient Christian. It was a law in Israel back in Leviticus chapter 19. Listen to this, verses 33 and 34. And if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, you shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you as one born among you. And thou shalt love him as thyself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Essentially, God is saying, 
I, you were a stranger and I took you in. I took care of you. You were in Egypt, strangers in Egypt. I cared for you. God is given to hospitality. And so for New Testament believers, this is a family trait, hospitality. You know, it shouldn't be, oh, so-and-so, yeah, they're really hospitable. Now, there are degrees of hospitality, expressions of it, and I believe there are some like the household of Stephanos, was it? Uh, there are those who are noted. There are those who have a gift of mercy. The Scriptures refer to that. So there are those who are perhaps head and shoulders above others. They're trendsetters, we might say, in regards to hospitality. But this is something that is to be a family trait. All believers are to have this character of God about them. Showing mercy. He has pursued you. He brought you into His house. You are of the household of faith. He sought you. Right? He sought you. He brought you in. You were a stranger. That's our cue, isn't it? He is our example. And so we are to be given to hospitality. Hospitality doesn't just happen. You need to pursue it. The idea of given is to pursue something, to practice it intentionally, not accidentally, not once in a blue moon, when it is so obvious you can't ignore it. You're, you're supposed to be given to this. Believers should be looking for opportunities to receive strangers into our lives or our homes. Thinking, think of, of mission fields. I don't know what it's like in Japan, but I, I know there are mission fields where doors of evangelistic opportunity have been opened in this very way because missionaries have gone and have practiced hospitality. And doors of opportunity have opened. To manifest Christ. And so I ask you, are you looking for opportunities to accommodate others who are strangers to you? Alexander Strout said this, Lack of hospitality among the Lord's people is a sure sign of selfish, lifeless, loveless Christianity. Is he speaking out of line? Is he being too harsh? Is that too narrow a statement? Lack of hospitality among the Lord's people is a sure sign of selfish, lifeless, loveless Christianity. Oh, you know your doctrine. You know correct church practice. We know how to behave ourselves in the house of God. Did you know this is not hospitality? And yet, even here, there needs to be a hospitable spirit so that those strangers who come in among us feel welcomed. Sense that there's something different going on here, especially those who are outside of Christ. There's something different here. Sometimes that thing that is different, it isn't always desirable, by the way. But we surely should at the very least give off an aroma, a spirit of Selfless, life-filled, love-filled Christianity, shouldn't we? Someone has said the most natural thing in the world is to neglect hospitality. The most natural thing in the world is to neglect hospitality. It's the path of least resistance. All we have to do is yield to the natural gravity of our self-centered life and the result will be a life so full of self that there is no room for hospitality. We will, for, we will forget about it and we will neglect it. So the Bible bluntly says, stop that. Stop neglecting hospitality. Practice hospitality. 
given to hospitality. Use hospitality. 1 Peter 4, 9. And there are benefits to practicing hospitality. Abraham was greatly blessed as he entertained strangers. We noted that last week. Have you ever experienced the blessing of open, opening up your home to believers you've barely met? I received a text this morning from a believer that was housed at my house a couple of weeks ago at that event. And his text was something like this. Hey, Brother Kyle, I woke early this morning and am praying. This text came at 5.30 something. And he said, I, if you would be willing to give me the names of your children, I would like to pray for them by name. That was a result of hospitality. I would have never gotten close to this man. He would have never known me. I would have never known him. The blessings of hospitality. You open up opportunity to become a blessing and to have a godly influence upon others as you welcome them into your life. Years ago, I went to the dentist and I always seek for opportunity to be a witness. Doesn't all, the, the door doesn't always open. You really don't want to get your dentist agitated while he's drilling. So, you know, so you wait for the right time <laughs> to talk to him. But as I gave him material, gospel material, eventually I invited he and his wife over to our house, my dentist and his wife to our house for a meal. They came. That's even more shocking. They came. I thought for sure God was dealing with my dentist. God dealt with his wife. She became a believer. He didn't. They ended up divorcing. But she became a member of the church it, by his choice, not hers. He, she became a member of the church and so on and so forth. All of that was a result of hospitality. You have your own stories. Those are blessings that God brings into our lives. And we simply open ourselves up. An opportunity to be a blessing. Are you, are we given to hospitality? There is a proper spirit that is associated with godly hospitality. The scriptures speak of this. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. And this is important. You see, this is not just something that is a checklist kind of thing, a duty kind of thing. Well, we... We've, we've been hospitable once this month. I think that's enough. That's not, that's not the point here. Or to, to overload yourself so that every night of the week you're engaged with strangers. That's not the point. The point isn't to drive you to a point of exhaustion, nor to live by a checklist of rules. The point is to have a spirit that guides you. Spirit of love. Hebrews 13, 1 and 2. Let brotherly love continue. And what's the very next thing? Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. The spirit of love. Brotherly love. Hospitality is a tangible measure of brotherly love. Let brotherly love continue. What is one Prime way to manifest that. It's entertaining strangers. It is not laborious. It's an expression of love. But you see, hospitality can be crowded out of our busy lives. And we can actually convince ourselves that we do have a hospitable spirit when we really don't at all. And it's interesting that the writer here says, be not forgetful. By the way, that's a command. That's an imperative. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. Why do you suppose that he says, be not forgetful? Because we are. This act of love can be crowded out of our minds and we can forget and life gets busy, doesn't it? And we're just trying to make ends meet. We're trying to get from one day to the next, one, one, one scheduled 
event to the next. And, and if you have children, well, you know the load that we're busier in our generation than any generation before us. With, with, with not, not just employment, with everything. So many things are allowed into our lives. And one of the things that tends to go is hospitality. And so the apostle says, be not forgetful. Don't, don't crowd that out of your mind. While you've got your mind wrapped around a lot of other things, don't let this escape your thinking. Be not forgetful. Or to put it positively, be mindful. To entertain strangers. This is an ex- Am I loving? Am I love? Oh, I've got love. I know I love. Do you? Here's one way you can measure if brotherly love is continuing. Philadelphia, by the way, that's the word, the Greek word, Philadelphia, brotherly love. This is how, this is how you know if it's continuing. Are you entertaining strangers? This is important. This is a manifestation of Christ in us. First Peter 4, 9. We're talking here about the Spirit associated with biblical godly hospitality. You'll notice it's not good enough just to do. It's not good enough just to use hospitality. It's not good enough just to open your homes or to give of yourself or to stop and help that ailing person that you notice along the highway or whatever the situation, whatever your, your neighbor, the one in need, that compassion moves you to help. Notice what he says in verse 9. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Without grudging. What's he saying? Without murmuring. Why do you suppose Peter included that? Well, you say, well, the Holy Spirit led him to write it. Okay, why did the Holy Spirit lead him to write that? Do you suppose that there was some experience in that day of people... Using hospitality, but complaining the whole time they're doing it. Murmuring. You ever shown hospitality without a a word of appreciation from the one that it was shown toward? Hey, church, have we ever shown hospitality without even a, a note of thank you? Has that ever happened? Sure, it's happened. So what is the tendency you know, see if we do that, you know, we have to be more careful next time, you know. We can't let people like that take advantage of us, right? Isn't that what happens? That's using hospitality begrudgingly. You can't do that. Does that sound like it's a sin? Well, if this is a command, it must be a sin. Because it's a breaking of the law of God, right? That's not, that's not love, and yet it is so natural for us. When somebody gives us accolades and we receive cards in the mail, and it's like, man, that felt good, I want to do that again. But somebody doesn't acknowledge, they don't return and say thank you, they take advantage of, it does something to us, messes with us. Sours us. Thus, Peter writes, use hospitality one to another without grudging, without murmuring. Ever had your schedule or your plans messed with? Because you chose to help someone? Boy, that's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, let's face it, we're we're human. That's a tough one. We ought to, perhaps we ought to be giving thanks that we have the opportunity to manifest the mercy of God. God manifesting His character, His nature through us. We have that opportunity. Yeah, it messed up some particular plan that we had, but maybe that opportunity was greater than the plan, the original plan. Without grudging. Isn't Christianity very practical? I mean, true biblical Christianity 
It is just so very, very practical. And in many ways, so contrary to our nature, to our flesh. Without grudging, without murmuring. One more point about this spirit. In Colossians chapter 3, 23 and 24. And whatsoever you do. So this includes hospitality. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. This is our spirit. This is our, our attitude. Do it as unto the Lord, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. You really aren't, first and foremost, serving the person who is in need. That's a byproduct of serving Christ. And you aren't doing it in order to be recognized, to be seen of men. You're doing it as unto the Lord. Do not evaluate whether or not a guest or a stranger deserves your expression of kindness. Do it as unto the Lord. And be careful about those ulterior motives in showing hospitality. Leave the results with the Lord. Trust Him. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. What's the goal of hospitality? Let me just give some bullet points here. Some of this is just review. It's rehearsing some things we've already said. So, if this sounds repetitious, just assume that it's needed. I'm not going to go into depth into each of these. But what is the goal of hospitality? Remember, it is not to impress. It is not for show. It's not even so that people will say what a hospitable person you are or what a hospitable church you are. You want to know a hospitable church? Check out CBC. And we sort of feel, feel proud about that. No, that's not the goal of hospitality. Like I said last week, the goal of hospitality is not really about the one showing hospitality. It's not about me. It's not about us as a church. The goal of hospitality really should include no agenda beyond manifesting the love of Christ. No agenda. You know, a, an opportunity to house or to engage with a stranger, to host a stranger for a meal, somebody that you're not that familiar with. Oh, this is an opportunity to... How would you finish that statement? Sell your thoughts, sell your product, sell whatever is big to you, win them over to something. Really? Is that, is that the goal of hospitality? The, hosp the goal of hospitality is to manifest in sincerity the love of Christ so that people can leave your home and say, they didn't seem to have an agenda. They were just kind. They were just compassionate. They just showed mercy. It doesn't look like there were any strings attached to that expression. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I think we've all been on the receiving end of the strings attached kind of expression. No, we just trust God to use us as He pleases. And so you go into a situation knowing that you are a child of God, a servant of God, and knowing this may very well be an opportunity for you to engage somebody with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, it may be an evangelistic opportunity. Or it may be somebody who is a believer who is struggling and you have an opportunity. But you don't go in with preconceived thought. You go in as a servant of the living God. Humbly. Willing to give of yourself 
Certainly not to earn favor with God. You do it heartily as unto the Lord, but not so that God won't like you better. It has nothing to do with that. The goal of hospitality is essentially, basically, basically it's to provide a need. You see someone that is in need or you're opening yourself up to the possibility of providing, engaging, getting to know. So fellowship with fellow believers whom we may not know well, that's part of hospitality. So fellowship is not disconnected from hospitality, but it's with those that we've maybe just met. We want to get to know them better. And we don't go through our checklist to make sure that they're doctrinally online with us before we let them into our, at our dinner table. No. You ever had a, you ever had a charismatic at your dinner table? Well, no, I wouldn't let a charismatic in my house. Why not? Why not? The scriptures do give us some guidelines there. If someone comes knocking on your door and says, Jesus Christ is not God, you're not supposed to bid them Godspeed. So there are some guidelines in scripture. We do need to be careful about that. This isn't just come one, come all. There are some guidelines. But you know, there are people who wouldn't say that Jesus is God because they don't know anything about God or Jesus. Should you have them into your home? Why not? Strangers. So not only fellowship with fellow believers whom we may not know well, but maybe we should think about the possibility of sympathizing with the lives of others as we hear their stories. Tell me about yourself. Do you have enough time to listen to somebody's story? Do you know everybody has a story? Everybody has a story. And some people have some real hard spots in their story. And they're looking for somebody to help. How are we going to be able to help if we don't take the time? We don't shut our mouths up long enough to listen. That's what I'm talking about, not having an agenda. Yeah, come to the table and you spend an hour. Just blah, 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 And then, well, I hope you enjoyed the meal. we got other things going on. No. No, it's... Talk to me about what's going on in your life. Where, where people actually may come to the place where they actually are comfortable. Rosaria Butterf Butterfield, Butterfield, regardless of what you think of her, if you know anything about her, if you look up her name after this message, her testimony is this, and she's huge, by the way, on this issue of hospitality. Because her testimony involved hospitality. She was a tenured professor at Syracuse University. And part of a community that most of us would be very uncomfortable spending any time with. But in the process of writing articles, blasting the Christian community, a pastor writes her and says, I'd like to invite you to my home. Took her a while. She actually threw that letter in the trash can. But she said it was different from any other letter I'd received. She'd re received a lot of hate mail from Christians. But she hadn't received anything quite like that. She pulled it out of the trash can and read it again. She laid it on her desk. Eventually, she made her way to the house. She didn't. It took her a while. But she, she went to the house. Pastor and his wife invited her in. The first meal. She was invited to a meal. The first meal, they never even brought up the gospel. They just got to know her. She didn't even go to church for a year. Now she's married to a pastor. I'm jumping ahead at the end of the story. God saved her. And she was a leader. You know what her, you know what her, her subject was that she mastered, that she taught at Syracuse University? Queer theory. She was a leader in the LBGT, now it's Q, community. God plucked her out. And it began with somebody manifesting hospitality. Isn't that amazing? 
I'm saying to you that this can be an evangelistic, I, I, I hesitate to say tool, but opportunity perhaps is, is the best word. It's a more natural approach as you visit with strangers who are unbelievers. So, you know, sometimes John Hedberg would just take people to a McDonald's. You know, homeless people, just take them to a McDonald's and just sit and listen and engage with them. That's hospitality. It's an expression of what we're talking about. But there are hindrances to hospitality. And I just summarize here bullet points. Selfishness, lack of love. Oh, I know we all have our excuses. We have our reasons why we can't. I just ask you to weigh your excuses against the Word of God. Maybe, maybe there's something deeper that you haven't dealt with yet that has closed you off. Maybe you don't have the spirit that you need. Now, I want you to know what I'm saying here is I'm challenging myself too. This isn't, you know, see, I've got three fingers pointing back at me here, right? This isn't all about you. It's about me. It's about us. Manifesting Christ. Hindrances to hospitality controlled by schedule. If there's anybody that loves a schedule, it's me. Mike, when do I eat lunch? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I mean, at noon, I'm walking out the door for lunch. I mean, people know it's probably not even safe. I'm so scheduled, you know, people know uh, what's going on. In fact, if, if, I, if, I, if the schedule isn't followed, what's wrong with the pastor, right? I, I am a scheduled person. I love a schedule. But, you know, that can get in the way. And I'm not being, uh, I'm not trying to go overboard here or say that we shouldn't have schedules because I think we should. I believe more is accomplished in the life of a person and a Christian when we do have a schedule. That's not the point. But the point, just like a budget, is a budget good? Is a budget good? Yeah, a budget's good. Budgeting time is good. Just like you budget money, budget time, it's good. But I'm telling you, you can become a slave to your budgets. You can, come, uh, you can become a slave to your schedules, unwilling to be flexible, yielding to opportunities to serve others. I can't do that because I've got my schedule. And we need sensitivity. We need, we need a, a discernment as you know, when our schedule needs to be displaced or rearranged or shifted when God grants to us an opportunity for hospitality. We're asking for it. I mean, we're asking, would you, are you, would you be, would you feel risky in saying, making this a part of your prayer? Lord, generate a more compassionate spirit in me, and would you give me opportunities to use hospitality, to be hospitable, Show me what that looks like in my life. My life's not like the pastor. He doesn't have any children. And, and, you know, his life is at a stage where he has more flexibility. He probably has more money than I do. And, and uh, you know, and, and his wife is on board with him. And I'm, I'm, this is, this is, I'm, I'm imitating a prayer that you might talk to the Lord about these things. Bobby, you, you don't have a, a, a wife that's going to cook a meal, right? I mean, you make a good salad, so you can do that. But, you know, I mean, maybe you can cook, too. I don't know. But uh, I, 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 I would be in trouble. I can do pot pie. I figured that one out. But, you know, I suppose somebody who is really in need would enjoy a pot pie. You know, in other words, it doesn't have to be the fine china type approach. It doesn't, oh, I can't have them because I didn't clean my house. Forget that. Hospitality doesn't demand that. It demands compassion. It demands a heart for people. Well, Jody and I were talking about this, and one thing that we 
recognize is that at this stage in our life, our, our, our house is generally clean most of the time because we don't have oxen in our crib. But sometimes the house is awfully quiet because we don't have oxen in the crib, you know? So, so there's toys scattered. So there's papers strewn about. So the school books didn't get all put up. You know, you have an opportunity to be hospitable. Kids, we can wait. We can wait. Most of you homeschool. You know, you can rearrange your schedule. You really can. Most of us can. But you're at a different place than I am. So you, what I, what I do and what I say, you can't follow that. You have to ask the Lord, show me what it looks like. But don't be controlled by a schedule. Don't fear. That's another hindrance. Fear to hospital. Fear. I'm afraid. And you could, if I were to ask, what are you afraid of? If you were honest, you could come up with some things. It probably wouldn't take long to come up with some things. Don't let fear stop you. Make compassion. You know, make compassion. May the love of Christ override the fear. And then there's that isolation. Just don't really want to get involved. I'd rather be alone. You see, these are problems that really are contradictory to the Spirit of Christ. How do you suppose God might choose to bless each of us if we are more intentional about being hospitable? If you're able to, opening up your home for ministry to saints and to sinners... As I mentioned last week, is your house a castle in which to isolate and bring up the drawbridge so nobody can enter? Or is it a God-given blessing for use in ministry? How do you view your house? And for those who are unable or unequipped with a home to use, how are you looking for ways to be hospitable? I... I think it would be helpful and encouraging for you to share stories. Not to boast and brag and convince everybody that you are hospitable. That's not even near the point. But you know, there may be some ideas that you have that I don't have. Some ideas that you have that your brother or sister doesn't have. Who really does desire to be hospitable, but I I just don't know how to work it out. We can help one another in this with practical things. Some of you guys have some great imaginations. Use them in regards to that and share your imagination. Not to dominate everyone. Not, you, you understand it's not to make everybody like you or me make you like me. But that the spirit of hospitality really does pervade Community Baptist Church. That's, that's what we need. And if you need a reminder, anytime you get a little discouraged, Maybe we'll close by singing this one. But if you, y'all know where I'm going. Um, if you need a reminder, a source of encouragement, here's the word of God on this is God's word to you and me. Hebrews 6 and verse 10. God is not, this is an amazing statement. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. But why did he put that in there? He didn't have to put that in there. And the way he could have just said, you better not, you better not forget to, to, to work and labor, to care. He could have just made it a, but he says, God is not unright. That's almost beyond my capability of thinking in that paradigm. God is not unright. Of course, God's not unrighteous. There is no unrighteousness with God. But it's as if he's saying God would be unrighteous if he forgot. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints. This is a specific area of hospitality. And do minister. Maybe there we could say, and do minister Not only to saints, but even beyond.
be encouraged. Let's stand together and do you have that?